This is a story about wild dogs, their impact on livestock and their impact on landholders and some solutions that have been put into place that have worked successfully, not only to save the livestock, but native flora as well. And the impacts on the community and the impacts positively on the producers. This is a story of landholders working with their local land services office. And this is a story of good fencing, making good neighbours. There will be images of wild dogs in this video. There will be images of injured sheep. So go and make yourself a cup of tea, sit back, learn about an incredible problem and some ingenious solutions. <laughs> I'm just outside of Ilford in New South Wales and I'm with Colin and Eva Clapham, local property owners, and Paul Gibb from local land services to talk about a very serious topic and that's wild dogs. So Colin, how many head of sheep do you run out here mate? Uh, give or take 6,000 we generally run. So about one sheep per acre? One sheep to the acre, yeah. Now one sheep per acre seems like a light stocking rate. Yeah, we do run our stock light compared to most in the area, we do, but I'm, I like big fat sheep, not little skinny sheep. So, so. welfare is a key component yeah, of that. Yeah. What sort of sheep are you running mate? Uh, all merino sheep. <laughs> Yeah, so so I'm wearing no self-replacing. So things were going along quite well for you guys, and then 2017 was quite a pivotal year for you. Yep. Yeah, we um, bought this block in 2017 and stocked it obviously, and everything was good until we we sure in that February, didn't we? Yeah. And yeah, we stocked it in February, and by May or yeah. thereabouts, we were moving stock off. Yeah. Um, because yeah. Of the dogs because yep. of losses yep. yep so wild dogs are moving in from the surrounding areas yep not only from the national park that we've got up behind us here but also from smaller unmanaged or less managed blocks around you yeah we're losing a lot of sheep how many sheep would you be losing a week oh anywhere up to 30 a week some weeks um before we when we stocked it we stocked it with sheep and before that the previous owner had only was running it as a steer operation. So we had no inkling that there was dogs here to start with. So. And that's it, a lot of property owners won't have a clue that there are dogs actually going through their property if they don't have a tax on the property. No, that's right. And a local bloke actually said he saw a dog one day up the top of the mountain here and none of the rest of us had seen dogs. So we all pretty much told him he was full of shit. But um, turns out he was right, so. And he yeah. was right in a big way, either it was fairly devastating impact on yourselves and your, your livestock. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Yep. It has an effect. It has a very it has an overall three tiered effect on everything. Yeah. Stock, lifestyle, um yeah, look, the list can go on. <laughs> and it did for you, didn't it? Yeah. For quite some yeah. time. Yeah, it we've did. got um we've got some good friends um that Cole's known for a long time and yeah he warned us from the get go. Um, about, uh, he said, I lost my marriage over it. He said, I lost my mind over it. He said, I lost a lot of stock over it. So yeah, it's got a lot of, um, yeah, it's, it affects everyone in different ways. Yeah. And it certainly affected you guys, but you were able to reach out for assistance. And one of those means of assistance was Paul here from the local land services. Yeah, that was good timing, wasn't it, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Paul and Brendan, actually. It's, Paul and Brendan Stubbs here, they were both really good. You got some pretty spectacular country on your property here, Colin. You got a bit of a cliff here. Yep. And uh, as beautiful it is, as it is, there's a particularly harrowing story about what used to happen to your sheep here. Yeah, the dogs used to push them down onto the cliff here, and anyone who knows sheep knows one goes, they all go. And yeah, they quite often used to end up piled up down there. So it'd be nothing to have 40 dead sheep no. down the bottom of the cliff? Yeah, no, that's, that was nothing to see that. So, not the best thing to find, but that's how it used to go. So Paul, as a local land services officer, you often have to deal not only with the problem of the dogs, but also with the incredible impact that it has on landholders like Colin. Yes, definitely. And it becomes very personal because you get to be good friends with these people over the years and you see the impact that it's having on their mental health 
uh, and sometimes they might not be aware of how bad it is impacting them. Yeah, it's pretty hard. It's, it's hard to try and help them and uh, also it's very hard to watch them struggle. Um, and I guess the, the bright spot in this story has been seeing the, the turnaround in people's mental health after putting this fence up. Um, not just here at Colin and Evers, but other people who participated in the program. It's been a game changer and many of these people will tell you they wouldn't still be here if it wasn't for the fence. The real impact is that these dogs uh, are attacking livestock and impacting on farmers such as Colin and Eva. Yeah. We got the LS involved, we formed dog groups, big baiting runs, the first couple of baits that we did, everyone sort of hopped on board with the baiting. We had trappers here that the LLS funded and they they were catching a lot of dogs. Like Ross caught, would we work out, 58 or 60 dogs in this area in 12 months. Like there was... Yeah, 56 dogs in the first 12 months. I think. Yeah, most people couldn't believe that there was that many dogs here. A lot of people didn't believe that there was any dogs here. So, but no, we started having a few wins and the losses slowed for sure, but they kept coming back. So Colin, we're about one and a half k's from your property and we've come across some dog tracks on a roadway here and you reckon this is pretty common? Yeah, um, you can see their dog tracks there by the, the claw marks in them. Yep. And um, going off how close together they are, there has to have been more than one dog. Because it's only about a hand space. It's only a hand space apart, so yeah, obviously that one and that one will be off one dog and this one's off another. So, so if you're looking at foxes, they're different to dogs? Yeah, foxes are little, little of footprint and round, yep. and you don't often see the claw marks off a fox, but you nearly always can see the claw marks off a dog. And dogs are normally about a foot apart, you were saying? Or a bit over a foot, yeah, a bit yeah. over a foot apart. So this so. one, much closer together, so you know that there's either two dogs or they've come back. Yeah, that's right, but they've definitely been heading that way. Which is towards your Towards place. our place. Yeah. So. Dogs yeah. like roads. A lot easier to walk down a road than it is to walk through the bush, yeah, for sure. So when so. we start to think, Paul, about dog psychology and where to look for dogs, look for dogs where there's human activity because it's probably going to be a similar environment that they like as well. Well, as Colin said, they, they tend to take the easier path through. They're just like you and me. Mm. You know, they want to get the easiest way from here to over the other side of that hill. So yes, they're going to run along tracks. They're going to run along easements, power line easements. So if you're looking for signs of dogs, don't rule out looking at some of these you know, really obvious places, especially yeah. on a sandy platform like this, you'll pick up tracks. Really easy. Now, Colin, you put out a number of cameras around this area, didn't you? Yeah. And you found a lot of dogs. Yeah. What else did you find on those cameras? Uh, pigs, foxes, deer, cats, you name it. Not a lot of natives. There was probably the only native was kangaroos and wombats, but no little native animals, lyrebirds, that sort of stuff, they just, they're not here. So we've got a feral apex predator that's out of control. Yep. The only stuff that's living alongside it and thriving is the other feral animals. All yeah. the natives have moved or dead. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And we definitely found that once we put our fence up, we had never seen a lyrebird on our place, but we, it's nothing to see a lyrebird now. We quite often see lyrebirds inside our fence. So, but we did not see them before that. So if people are concerned about controlling dogs, we've got to get the message out. If you love your native animals, dogs have got to be your first priority, don't they? They do. Look, in the bush, all bush can handle some dogs, but not when they get to a point where the apex predator's eating everything. Like, they, they've got to be at a sustainable level for sure. Yeah, it's a, a pretty common thing for people to say that, oh, the dogs control the kangaroo numbers or the dogs live off the kangaroos. And, you can't run a kangaroo down in that. They're, they're living off the little, the little natives, the little birds. So it's not, kangaroos aren't first on the list, I suppose is what I'd say. So we're just about to go into your place now, Colin. Yep. Um, and this is another typical area where you'd expect dog activity, isn't it? High, high voltage transmission. Yeah, lines. high voltage lines, maintained road underneath them, easy access for dogs. Yep. To move through the landscape. 
once again, where it's easy, that's where you're going to find the dog's concentrating pool. Yep, they will use the, the terrain to their best advantage. So anywhere they can track along, like an easement or a road, or a trail through the bush, yeah, they'll, they'll follow it. Yep. So Colin, you started out primarily with Paul's assistance, trapping and baiting the dogs. Yep. How much impact did that have on you? It, it probably reduced our impact by half, I'd say. It, it definitely took, took the sting out of it but it didn't eliminate it altogether, no. So you, you were telling me off camera you got about an eight week window when you did a successful trapping and baiting program. You had about eight weeks of yeah. relatively low pressure before the pressure started up again. Yeah, we'd have an eight week gap on, like generally, before another, another dog or another group of dogs would move into the area for sure. <laughs> now Colin, you've got a lot of neighbours and a lot of them are small blockies, like yep. 10 to 100 acres. You have 20 or 30 of them. Yep. And they probably don't ever see a dog on their property, do they? That's your experience? Yeah, that's that's right. I've I spent a lot of my life looking for dogs and I've probably only seen three of a daytime in the wild. But I've seen hundreds on cameras of a night. So, it, so it's, just because people aren't seeing dogs on their property doesn't mean they're not there? No. No, no, that's, that's for sure. You can look for them all you like and you very rarely see them. Or once you do start seeing them, you've got, got a lot more than you think. Paul, it's really important when you're in a control environment like this that you get everyone living around the area involved, isn't it? That's right. The more people participating in control programs, the better. It, it yeah. helps everyone. Um, so if people want to come and have a yarn to us about what to do, how to get involved with a group, just give your local land service office a call and we're more than happy to help you. Because yeah. by looking after farmers like Colin, you're not only helping the farmer stay on the farm and keep the rural environment the way it is, but you're also going to rehabilitate your property and make it more of a habitat for native wildlife, aren't you? Exactly. Exactly. The programs that we're looking at rolling out uh, not only target the wild dogs, but also pick up foxes as well. And foxes are a big predator on, on native wildlife. Yeah. So it's in everyone's interest to get involved and control an apex predator that's out of control. It certainly is a great thing to have many people participating as we can get. Now, we've touched on the human element here before, but it was really hard on you guys, um, particularly around 2017, yep. um, in having to deal with the after effects of dog attacks on your property week after week after week. Yeah, it was. It was it, 2017 to 2019, it wasn't a, a good time at all. It wasn't. We were had two little kids. I was full-time working, wife was managing the place, and it was just relentless. It had taken a long time, I suppose, to even get past it, but it never ever goes away. So baiting and trapping were working, they were giving you some respite, Yep. but it wasn't sustainable, was it? There's a huge amount of work involved just doing that. Paul, you need to use every trick in the book, don't you? You certainly do. Baiting and trapping are important. Yep. but they're not the only means of control for dogs, are no, they? No, they're not, you're right. Uh, you've got to use every tool that's available to you, uh, and that is why we went and did a, a tour down to the southern part of the state, took landholders, including Colin, uh, down to Tumbarumba to look at the use of electric fencing for wild dog prevention. And that was a great trip. Uh, the results were that obvious to people there that we came back here in the Central Tablelands Local Land Service, put some funding together to help subsidise landholders who wanted to put up this style of fencing. So yeah. Colin you took advantage of that obviously. We did. Every tool, yep. in, every tool in the toolbox is important. I wasn't building an electric fence when we went there but I was building one on my way home. It's not until you see it in action that yeah. you actually get a full grasp I, of it. I, you started out with baby steps didn't you? You just put leaning offsets on your existing fences to begin with? Yeah we did. Um, probably three quarters of our place had an existing boundary which we put the leaning offsets on. Uh, the other quarter didn't have a boundary but we didn't need a boundary as it's all cliff on top of the mountain but it's now fenced because yeah the dogs soon found their way around it. This view is incredible yeah but it's also really significant isn't it? Yeah it puts a few joins a few dots together you can once you sort of know how dogs work it sort of it lets you you can see why they travel where they travel. So you've got these power lines here running down the side of your property going all the way over to Ralston, which we can see is that faint patch of clearing over the bottom of the far mountains. And you've got dogs going all the way between there and here. Yes. Using the power lines as their track. Yeah, they do. 
They do quite quite regularly. Like, and this whole boundary is just open to it. Whole boundary is open to it. Yes. So this was one of the first fences that you actually started to electrify. It was. Yep. This is where the majority of our problem was coming in. So it was first one done. And you've kept the fe the original fence, but all you've done is put a leaning offset. Yep. of eye posts, insulators, and yep. just run power lines around it. And you're using a fairly decent unit, aren't you? Yeah, we are. We're using a 10,000 eye unit. Um, the Gallagher rep at the time, Brendan, that was what he suggested. And he also said that the offset will fix our problem. And I wasn't as sure, but I'm definitely sure now. So it certainly fixed the dog problem, but there was an unintended consequence that was positive as well. Yep. The paddock we're standing in, mate, is full of grass. Yeah, grass and weeds, but it used to just be weeds. So there was never any ground cover here. Um, kangaroos numbers up here were, I'd hate to guesstimate what the kangaroo numbers were up here, but I definitely couldn't control them, that's for sure. So just simply by putting this leaning offset on the bottom of the fence, people think that kangaroos jump over fences. Most of them don't. That's no. prevented mobs of roos from coming in and cleaning up your grass. Yep. You're now running more sheep. That's right, yeah, we're probably running 30% more now and doing it a lot easier. Like if we lock a paddock up now, it's locked up. So if we don't come back and there's 200 kangaroos in there eating it. So, so no roos pinching your feed, no dogs harming your sheep. For sure. No roos, no pigs, no deer, no dogs. That's a pretty significant improvement, isn't it? It is. Makes life a little boring at times, but it is definitely an improvement. Paul, we're up on top of the hill here in the middle of Colin and Eva's farm. Spectacular, mate. It is. It's incredible. It is. It's a magnificent part of the world. And I think it just rams home the fact that you're always going to have dog problems in a location like this, aren't you? Well, that's right. When we look out to that far horizon, we're, we're bounding on two of the biggest national parks in New South Wales. Significant amount of real estate. And, you know, the reality is the dogs will keep coming. They've, they've come for hundreds of years out of there. They will keep coming. So it doesn't matter how good a job national parks are doing, and they are. Yep. You're just not going to get on top of dogs in that country, are you? No, you won't. And I guess that inevitably leads you towards the conclusion that a fence to keep the dogs out is probably the best option available to people in this environment. And the unintended consequences, I mean, we're standing on the top of the hill and there's grass in abundance yep. where it used to be dirt. Exactly. The extra kilograms of dry matter being produced on this farm now due to the fence and giving control over the total grazing management has just provided a real bonus on the bottom line for pasture. As an ex-dairy farmer, mate, you must be salivating. That's pretty good. Now, Colin, another unintended consequence of these new fences is your dams aren't as full. No. I think that's a good thing. It is a good thing. We, um, we don't get the erosion on this sandy country. We used to really have to watch our, our ground cover to stop erosion. Um, we don't get the erosion, but we don't get the water that we had either. So, so you've had a fair bit of rain over summer. Yep. And rather than running down the hills with all the silt and sediment, it's actually stayed up on the hills and gone into the ground with the ground cover. Yeah, it has. We've had 220 mils in four months, and typically this dam would be running over and probably half full of silt, but um, no, we don't get the runoff. And you're putting that down to the Gallagher fences being in place? Yeah, just the ground cover we have now after putting the fence up, it, you can't compare it to before. Like we have 100% ground cover and we can we can maintain that ground cover. If the ground cover's starting to get eaten off, we can pull the stock off and we don't have the wildlife pressure. So, Because you, you were doing good management before. When your ground cover got down, you pulled the stock off, but then the roos had come in, cleaned it up and completely denuded it. Yeah, that's it. right. Whatever we left, the kangaroos ate. So, so now you can actually manage your property better, run 30% more stock, yeah. and you don't have the erosion and the no. runoff that you used to have. No, no, next to no erosion at all. So Colin, you're now full convert to electric fencing with new fences that you're putting up where you're not adapting the old existing fences with the foot, you're actually going for full suspension fence. Yep. Run out of what sort of unit? Uh, it's all run out of a 10,000... I think it's a 10,000 eye unit of Gallagher's. Uh -huh. um, we've probably 
split five or six paddocks in half now and just ran the, the upright suspension fence. It's cheaper, it's quicker, and it works well. So. And being a suspension fence, you don't have to put as many steels in. So in this rocky country, that's helpful as well. It takes yeah, time, isn't it? On the boundary, we're at one steel every 10 metres. Yep. On the internals, we're one every 12. And it, it seems to be fine. Um, don't need the tension on your wire, obviously, because nothing pushes on it. So you don't need big box assembly, end assemblies, just a typical stone strainer, and away you go. Now in terms of maintenance, some people have a fear of electric fences because they think they'll get faults and they can't find them. What's been your experience several years in now? Yeah, that, that was my biggest qualm when we started that I thought the same. But I can walk to my shed every morning and one, know that that fence is going. And if it's not, with the use of the monitors, I know what section of fence the short's in. And yeah, it doesn't take me long to find it. So the fences can be remotely monitored. Yep. You can find the faults easily. And how often do you have faults? When we first put it up, that first month, we would have a fault pretty regularly, um, just till the livestock, uh, the livestock and the wildlife were educated on the electric fence. But now we might have a fault once a month, once every six weeks. And you guys were regularly maintaining your old fences? Yeah. Always maintain. That's it was half our job maintaining old fences, mend and roof holes. So you did some interesting back of the envelope calculations on time and labour, didn't you? And you figured uh, something out. Yeah, we we put the fence up out of necessity for dogs, obviously. But when you sit down and do the figures, like if you spend ten hours a week maintaining fences at fifty dollars an hour, it works out at twenty five thousand dollars a year. You can put five k's of fence up for 25000 So it, our fence, without the extra grass, with no dogs, will pay itself back in four years' time. Just in the savings on maintenance? Just in the savings on maintenance, without the grass and the dogs. And there's been one final and really important saving grace of this fencing system, isn't it? And that's neighbours. Yeah. I probably get along a lot better with my neighbours now that the, the wildlife living on their place isn't impacting me. So I'm not ringing them every week in a bad mood. And no, I get along a lot better with my neighbours now than I did for sure. It's a chestnut, but good fences make good neighbours. That's, tr that's true, definitely. No <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time to be out with us today. No it's worries been at all. a fantastic story about you guys battling against a wild dog problem, solving yeah. it and then seeing a whole heap of other benefits come out of it. And I just hope that you continue on to do great things for your family. Yeah, no, well, I hope so too. Like, yeah, no, it, it, um, the fence definitely solved our dog problem. It didn't manage it, it didn't control it, it solved it. Our fence has been up seven years now and I haven't had a dog in since. So. And all the other side benefits that come Yeah, with all the other, all the unforeseen benefits. Yeah, they're just the cream on top. Good on you, mate. Lovely. I hope you have many years to come of good service. Thank you.